Thursday morning is when this happens. The Supreme Court hears that at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, which means by the time we come on the stage that night, we'll have stuff to talk about. This is uh, an amazing, uh, and from the world's point of view, it's an amazing coincidence that we just so happen to be in Colorado on the very day that this is being decided by the Supreme Court. Let me welcome uh, again my guest, but when you hear this, Lance, uh, this really is a big deal what's happening Thursday night. Well, it's a big deal uh, for a couple of reasons. The appeals court just denied Trump, the D.C. appeals court denied Trump immunity in 2020 criminal election cases. And of course, they, the, uh, the case that uh, Jack Smith is pushing is that Trump was election interfering on January 6th. So um, this, is, uh, this is the lawfare reaching a crescendo. They really want to put Trump in court if possible, somehow before the election, because he's winning in all the states that are important. And uh, they think that if he gets convicted, according to their polling, the uninformed average voter would say, oh, well, if he's convicted, then I'm not going to vote for him. So they're desperate to try to figure out how to convict him. And I'm praying the Supreme Court doesn't lose its nerve because it's right there. Remember, Chuck Schumer threatened them. You know, they're going to reap the whirlwind if they don't start voting the way the Democrats want. And I certainly hope that they, they, they discover the courage to do their job right because this is all political. It is all political. And Pastor Hank, can you hear this? Uh, I, I still think it's, it's very interesting, to say the least, that we're going to be in Colorado Thursday, the very day that this is happening. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's no coincidence that we're going to the high places. Many times in the Bible, the high places were places that the demonic community went to and released things that would affect territories, cities, regions. But it was also the places that God would instruct his people to go up into the high places and deal with demonic entities that were trying to bring about a contrary agenda like what we're talking about here with President Trump, a contrary agenda. God's hands upon President Trump. God has intentions for President Trump, and I believe that they will be accomplished because we the people have prayed, we have stood, and we have believed God. President Trump also stands for the very things that doesn't Evo invoke the judgment of God, but rather his blessing. So I think Colorado is set up for reform. I think us being there are going to help bring a shift that okay. the Lord is going to bring to this country. And ultimately, I believe that the Supreme Court is going to rule according to God's righteousness and God's justice and we the people. Amen to that. All right, let me show you this clip. Uh, arguments are set for the Supreme Court on Thursday Watch this and we'll be right back. The biggest and the most consequential election case to go to the U.S. Supreme Court since Bush v. Gore back in 2000. Ultimately, the justices will decide if Donald Trump can be on the ballot here in Colorado and in states all across the country. And this is the question before the high court. Did the Colorado Supreme Court err in ordering President Trump excluded from the 2024 presidential primary ballot? Remember, back in December, the state Supreme Court ruled four to three that Donald Trump is disqualified from being president because he violated Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Basically, the justices ruled that Mr. Trump was an officer of the U.S. and engaged in an insurrection. His team appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which is hearing arguments in this case on Thursday. And here is how they're going to go. 80 minutes total. That is it. Donald Trump's legal team, led by Jonathan Mitchell, has 40 minutes. Lawyers for the six Colorado voters who filed the original lawsuit have 30 minutes. And the Colorado Secretary of State's office, represented by the Solicitor General, Shannon Stevenson, will have 10 minutes. I talked with the Secretary of State, Jenna Griswold, earlier today about the prep that goes into this case, including getting grilled by nine Supreme Court justices. The justices can ask really whatever they want. So we want to make sure that she's prepared, of, of course, to get into the meat of our case, which is a state can pass a law to keep disqualified candidates off the ballot, uh, but also go through some of the curveballs. 
And I asked Donald Trump's lawyer, who's arguing before the court to talk with me today. He's tied up with preparation and couldn't, but here's their argument summed up in a brief they filed recently. Quote, the court should reverse the Colorado decision because President Trump is not even subject to Section 3 as the president and is not an officer of the United States under the Constitution. And even if the president were subject to Section 3, he did not engage in anything that qualifies as an insurrection. The court should reverse on these grounds and end these unconstitutional disqualification efforts once and for all. As a reminder, cameras are not allowed in the U.S. Supreme Court, but audio from the arguments will be live stream. They are scheduled to start at 8 a.m. Mountain Time. Again, that's this Thursday. Jeremy. All right. Uh, let me go to Rick Green. Rick has joined the show. Welcome to tonight, Rick. When you, you hear this, hey, what's Jim. happening Thursday, uh, officer, can you kind of explain to our audience why you're saying he's not an officer of the United States? What does that yeah, mean? Yeah, so, and, and, and let's just work backwards, right? So, first of all, there was no insurrection. Nobody's proved there's right. a, there was ever an insurrection, uh, so there's no insurrection. But even if there was an insurrection, he didn't participate in the supposed insurrection that took place. And even if he had participated, he would not fall under this definition of officer in in, uh, in this section of, of the 14th Amendment. And there's a lot of, there's case law, uh, there's the understanding of what the founding fathers called an officer, there's the use of the word officer in other places. In the Constitution, it used to be that virtually everybody understood the president does not fit under this definition of officer or this use of officer. But, of course, the nuance and the ignoring all of that case law and that history uh, is how they've managed to do in Colorado and, and these other places what they've done. I don't think the Supreme Court will play that game, though. I think they, they, they will bind themselves to what the history is, what the intention was. They'll look at the debates when the words were used. They'll look at what was taking place when the 14th Amendment was ratified. Um, so it's not only the meaning of, of the 14th Amendment, which was the people that were you know, doing that in the 1860s. It's also the meaning of the what the founders meant all the way back uh, in the beginning of the Constitution being created. So you got to take all of these pieces, and that's what the, the, the Supreme Court will do, and go through each of those arguments. And it's nuanced, it's detailed. Most people are not going to dive into that. But I can tell you, I 100% agree with that summary that you just heard, that there is no question. And Mike Lee's been making this argument for several right. years now. There's no question. Donald Trump is not an officer under that use of officer in right. the 14th Amendment. And I believe the Supreme Court will find that. Well, it's going to be interesting. Let me uh, let me show you this, uh, Luke. Uh, Congressman Matt Gates will be introducing a resolution to once and for all declare President Trump did not engage in an insurrection or rebellion against the United States. This will force other reps to go on the record and show us whether or not they are actually America first or they're merely Cheney and Kinzinger Democrats. Your thoughts? It's really interesting, the few square miles in Washington, D.C. that makes up the Capitol and the Supreme Court building is one of the highest concentrations of spiritual warfare that we see in America and the world today. I believe that when you see this back and forth between whether or not we're going to keep Trump on the ballot in various states, this isn't just attack on Donald Trump himself. This is an attack on the Republic because they know that if they can get Donald Trump off the ballot, they can put in a Republican who's not going to stand up for life. They can put in a Republican that's not going to stand Stand up for the family unit. They're going to put somebody in who's not going to stand up for any values that conservatives and Christians hold true and dear today. I was in Washington a couple days ago. I'm just outside of Washington right now. And when I was at the Supreme Court building, there's a statue of the Ten Commandments just about 30 feet away from the chambers of the Supreme Court. You know that if we move those Ten Commandments like 35 feet inside the Supreme Court, that everyone would have a complete meltdown. The media, the left, independents would freak out. But if we have had a Satanist statue in there, there probably wouldn't be an outcry from any of them. They would just say that it's part of a continuation of a conglomerate of religions and tolerance and things of that nature. That is indicative of the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in right now, because they know that they're not just warring against Donald Trump. It's not just one anointed candidate or anything like right. that, but rather the policies and the principles that we know he will stand up for because he put some of those justices into the Supreme Court. So when you're looking at these battles going on in various states and us being in Colorado and just a few days. Know this. This is not just us holding a presentation or advocating for any even particular policy. This is a matter of spiritual warfare. It is a battle between good and evil, and we're going to stand up as Christians together and say right. we're not going to stand for it. We're not going to stand for it, Pastor Hank. I, you agree with That's Luke right. there? 
Yeah, because, you know, I'm thinking of a scripture. I don't know the exact verse, but I feel the Spirit of God is quickening it where it talks about when the people prayed that it came up into the ears of the Lord Sabio. The Lord Sabio is the Lord of, of, of angel armies. He is the supreme God. He's the one that dictates and rules according to righteousness and justice. And I believe that Colorado, listen to me, you have prayed, others have prayed, and now is the time for your reform. So therefore, I believe it's come up into the ears of the Lord Sabio. And there's a prophecy, Pastor Gene, where God said, I will deal with the judges of the earth and especially in the United States, and they will begin to judge right. righteously. And I believe this is going to happen with the Supreme Court. And I agree with Rick Green, by the way. I think they're going to ultimately find that they don't really have a case to, to uh, side with, with Colorado and what they want to do by keeping them off the ballot. Well, uh, one thing for sure, this is not slowing down Donald Trump. In fact, President Trump will be holding a massive <clears throat> and historical campaign rally in Bronx, New York, on March 16th. Watch this. If President Trump came here to the South Bronx, would you attend the rally? Of course. I would want to meet Trump. I want to shake his hand. He's the only president that I see that can ever make America great again. He's capable of doing that. I would love to go to a rally with Donald Trump come. Cause I'm a big Donald Trump supporter, and I will support him 100%. Oh, yeah, definitely we're going to show him love. We're going to show him a lot of love, and, you know, like they do in other states. We definitely need to see Trump here. There's nothing but love for Donald Trump here in the South Bronx, the North Bronx, the East Bronx, and the West Bronx. So, you tell we me— want, We want Trump to come back. Please, bro. Biden, get out of here, bro. I will come to the rally and support Trump, because the Bronx need a change, and we need somebody that's really going— help this community. I would definitely come to a Trump rally in the South Bronx. I like him. You do? Yes. Yes, I will come to a rally if President Trump was to come to the Bronx, and I also would bring other people to come to and support him. Would Joe Biden get a warm reception if he came to the Bronx? No, he wouldn't have. And I'll make sure of that. <laughs> Okay. All right, Lance. Uh, you, you saw that. Uh, but if you listen to the mainstream media, they would have you believe that New York has turned on him. Uh, your thoughts about this latest uh, move to New York? Nothing, uh, nothing, Gene, unnerves the left more than Donald Trump's audacity in being willing to go places and pack out arenas because it just throws off their whole narrative about how everybody hates Trump. He has that celebrity status in New York. I mean, they just, they just criminally took $83 million from him uh, because of an accusation of a woman who he claims he never met, who accused him of doing something he never did. But the New York, uh, you know, jury and the, and the corrupt uh, system up there just wanted to fine him anyway. And so he's, he's actually going right in the place that has cursed him and he's going to bless them. And uh, now that they're doing a $53 million credit card deal where Eric Adams, the mayor, is giving $53 million worth of credit cards to illegals in the state, you bet that the common man and common woman on the street is going to be interested in going to a rally and hear what Donald Trump has to say. And this freaks them out because he has the ability to flip places like that. He certainly does. And, and Lance, the, the, the whole issue here... Uh, with Trump in New York, the, the, no matter what they do, it seems to go, it seems to work for him. And he, he's bold and he keeps going at it again and again. However, let me show you this. Uh, NBC News reports, it wasn't clear before, it's clear as day now. All the Trump indictments are purely political. Pro-Biden super PAC set to spend up to $40 million amplifying Trump's legal woes. Uh, Rick, you see that. Uh, should there be cause for concern with the Trump campaign? No, please, please spend $40 million <laughs> amplifying his legal woes. As we've said here on Flashpoint many, many times, every time they indict him, every time they talk about it, it just amplifies the Un, the injustice that's taking place. It amplifies the two-tier justice system, which causes more and more people to come over to his side. So huge mistake on their part. It's only going to help Trump in the long run. It's turning people just like in New York. I don't know. I don't think he can actually put New York in, in play. I don't think. I mean, uh, it, you know, bigger surprises have happened. Uh, but I think Lance is right, man. It drives them nuts when he goes right into the belly of the beast, when he actually just has the audacity uh, to go after the very areas that they think are completely off the table. And, and 
I think it's people feeling the pain. It's just like, you know, Lance talking about that, whatever the 53 million that they're going to throw at illegal aliens and the, and the pain that's happening uh, in all of these cities as a result of bad policy. When you experience the pain, you start saying, man, there's got to be a better way. Who else is out there? What else can be done? And like it or not, Democrats, uh, all of the pain that people feel during a presidential administration, they associate to whoever happens to be president. Now, I do think it's the Biden administration, whether it's Joe or all the people pulling the strings behind the scenes, that has caused the pain. And so whether Democrats like it or not, he's stuck with this. Democrats are stuck with this. And that means Trump can take advantage of it and show people there is a better way. Think back to when he was president and how much better times were. It's the old Reagan thing. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? It matters in swing states. Look at this graphic. Now, understand, this is a Bloomberg News. Uh, all states, if the November election for U.S. president were being held today, Joe Biden and Donald Trump were on the ballot, who would you vote? Now, look at the top left there. I mean, there's uh, Trump, 48 percent, 42. But now let's go down some of the states. Arizona, 47 to 44. Georgia, 49 to 41. Michigan, 47 to 42. Uh, so you, you see, this is this is clicking along. Nevada, 48 uh, percent Trump, 40 for the Blue Party. Uh, North Carolina, 49 to 39. Pennsylvania, 48 to 45. Wisconsin, 49 to 44. All showing uh, a lead in this poll. Uh, so, Pastor Hank, tell me what you think of that. Do you think that says uh, what the future holds? Well, I think I go back to Ohio when we were there for a Flashpoint Live and the Spirit of God began to talk about the swing states would begin to swing towards the right direction in our country and would begin to stand for what's right and stand for those who are right. But you got to go back to your previous discussion that we were talking about the money and all of that. And uh, Andrew Womack was on last night's Flashpoint uh, here with us and he talked about what's happening in Colorado and how they have the Democrats the liberals have spent all these years with all their money, you know, uh, legislating and bringing in people who just have some very, very twisted, corrupt uh, ideologies, agendas, and they got elected into places of, of power and authority. And so what, when I look at these swing states, I think it reflects where the people are at. And I think it also reflects who they're voting for and who they will vote for. Because ultimately, a Democratic Party can have a lot of money. The RNC, they seem like they just need to get their act together. Ultimately, it's going to come down to, I think, something that has touched the American people. And it's this. It's touched the American people and their pocketbook. And they're not going to stand for people anymore. They're going to misuse funds. They're not going to stand for high gas prices, inflation, open borders. Right. And so ultimately, it's going to be we the people that I think are going to outvote the money machines and we're going to take our country back. Amen. Amen. That's good.